Hello. Welcome to the Other Worlds podcast, where we explore the worlds of fantasy, paranormal, and supernatural through our very favorite awesome books. And we get to talk and explore those worlds with the authors. I am Carrie Schaefer, one of your guides to the other world. I am the author of the Between Fantasy Trilogy and the Shadow Valley Manor Paranormal Mystery Series, along with some other women's fiction type books written by my alter ego, the kinder, gentler me, Carrie Ann King. And this is my co-host, Nola. Nola, introduce yourself, please. Hello, I am Nola Nash. I am the author of the Crescent City series, the Traveler series, and House of Mirrors, all of which are paranormal fantasy mystery with lots and lots of history. And our guest today, we are very excited about this. Mm -hmm. Our guest today is Richard Swan, who is very kindly joining us at the time of this recording from Australia at, I believe, seven o'clock in the morning with uh, small children in the house. And he is heroic as his character, really. <laughs> yep. He is the author of um, a trilogy, and he's going to have to remind me what the trilogy is actually called here in a minute because I've forgotten. The second book of which is The Tyranny of Faith. We'll let Richard get you all up speed on all of that, a little bit about him. Richard was born in North Yorkshire and spent most of his early life on Royal Air Force bases in Yorkshire and Lincolnshire. Why did I say Yorkshire and Lincolnshire? That's, anyways, never mind. It's an interesting <laughs> thing that the American language wants to do. After studying law at the University of Manchester, Richard was called to the bar in 2011. He subsequently retrained as a solicitor specializing in commercial litigation. Between 2015 and 2018, Richard self-published The Art of War Trilogy, a sequence of epic space opera novels, as well as a prequel, and two spin-off mill sci-fi novellas. And recently now he, oh here we go the empire of the wolf trilogy thank you there it is notes for saving me <laughs> richard's debut fantasy empire of, of the wolf trilogy sold to orbit books for a six-figure sum and we are jealous but we have decided that and we will love him we'll anyway. like him anyway I'm like whatever <laughs> Fine. <laughs> when he is not writing or working, Richard can be found in London with his wonderful wife, Sophie. This is no longer true. They are now in Australia, where they attempt to raise, with mixed results, their two we tell lies. very loud sons. When we just tell lies about where people are. <laughs> <laughs> lies. Hey, it's all as lies. Always, before we bring Richard on, we are going to draw a tarot card for the day. Yes, indeed. And today we are using one of my decks. Uh, mm -hmm. We have many wonderful decks. This is the Epic Tarot deck. Ooh, that's cool looking. It is cool looking. And it reminds me of our portal. What? Sorry? The cover, the back of them reminds me of our portal. Oh, it reminds me of the portal. Yeah, a little bit. Wooshy? Okay. Is that so, a word? We'll ask Richard. He's good with words. Shuffling His wooshy really word. <laughs> and the card that I have found is this one right here it's number two which in nonola's uh, are expert. magician is that the magician well, no that's one normally it would, no not the magician it would normally be the high that's priestess one. high priestess but what high we have priestess. here is a dude a dude a dude and Ooh. it's the keeper of mysteries so oh, i'll ask richard God. later how this works with the book I think it works beautifully. I think it's the perfect card, actually. Books and knowledge point to the doors of mystery. To experience magic, you must cross the threshold and give yourself over to the mystery, letting go of expectation. It's so. funny how our cards always fit the book. And we, y'all, you may think that we pick these cards ahead of time. We don't. We're it's, just as surprised as you are when the card comes up and it always seems to work. I love it. Perfect today. It's very good. Okay. All right. So we want to get Richard on here because people would much rather have him show the world and listen to us well, go on probably his accent's better than ours anyway his accent is better than ours okay all right opening the portal and hopefully on the other side if all goes well we will find richard and be in the world of um the wolf trilogy <laughs> oh God, what if it doesn't go well <laughs> is that not okay all right here we go. all right hello here we it went well. Oh, good. 
air. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> no, oh. I the airport all there. <laughs> no, 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 we are going to ask you about the card later, so just hold mm -hmm. that in your mind about, about it how it all fits. Extraordinary, uh, extraordinary draw, wasn't it? I mean, it fits so well, I thought. It's perfect. It's absolutely it's perfect. So funny. tell us, before we get into all of that, where we are now, what world are we in? Not what's actually behind you in your physical reality. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You are now in the world of the, the Sovan Empire. So um, the Sovan Empire is, uh, in the novel, it's an empire that has recently expanded very, very quickly. So the Sovans are these sort of high-minded, um, sort of civic-minded law power of you know the legal ethical moral infrastructure of of the state and they've expanded very quickly using these uh their legions of sort of elite troops sort of a bit, a bit like the roman legions sort of heavy infantry they've expanded and they've taken over this sort of sort of teutonic um slavic type uh sort of secondary world so it's a, it's a collection of um about maybe sort of 10 or so nations um and at the very top you have this sort of cold um marshy sort of desolate arable land um next to the coast and so it's sort of sort of pagan pagan worshippers whose uh whose sort of religion has, has now become illegal um and you have sort of much further sort of south southwest you have a sort of spanish kind of iberian french sort of peninsula sort of hot and and mediterranean and then sort of sover itself which is um essentially I, the way i describe it is sort of if monster and uh, if sort of rome existed in in germany in the kind of like sort of sort of oh. 15th century um nice. but in sover as well as well as having these sort of enormous kind of walls around it so it's sort of sort of medieval en city enormous walls i'm enormous. interrupting for a minute because in the city they're they're so big that when mm. uh, helena enters for the first time that she's That's seen right. this place, she's completely kind Overawed, of freaked yes. out by how how big the walls are which are obviously magically absolutely yeah well that's and that's it and 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 the buildings themselves you have big temples and buildings of state and palaces and lots of them are kind of held not by mad they're sort of too tall for what is then modern engineering so um they're held up by magic you know they've got these runes inscribed in the in the bedrock in the foundations which sort of hold these things up so it's, it's sort of like a fantasy manhattan if you like it's sort of you know, sky, nice. skyscrapers and stuff um and it's it's uh, it's it's a sort of a moderately peaceful empire, um, but uh, it's only been around for fifty years. And sort of factions within the Senate, within Sovra, are now coming coming to the fore, trying to kind of destabilize the nation. And the biggest sort of um, threat is this church versus state um, as well. So you've got the sort of the, the priests of the the Neiman Church. Uh, so, so the Church of Nema, uh, much like the sort of the Roman Empire, again, is, the Church has absorbed all of the religions of the surrounding nations and has said, yes, well, and done a bit of a rebrand. In the same way the sort of Achaemenid Persian Empire did as well, you sort of you take over a country and then you just sort of say under new management and you sort of leave everything basically in place. Um, but you just do a bit of a rebrand, and so oh, this god is now called this god, and you know, but everything. You, but you just sort of carry on and you pay your taxes to us now, and so it's sort of like that. It's, um, and uh, the Neiman Church, which was used to be the sole custodians of magic in the world, um, have had their uh, the sort of the magics taken away from them by sort of the secular forces of, of law and law enforcement. Um, right. So the mag so, magistratum. So let's let's talk about that for a little bit, because really the only people who can legally use magic, uh, if I got this all right, really yes. are the the justices, which is interesting. Right. You being mm -hmm. a lawyer type person yourself. <laughs> you yes. magical lawyer you <laughs> that's literally the kernel of the, the whole idea came from i was like what if magical lawyers <laughs> that's, that's just literally the idea i had see i didn't have that idea that's why i don't have a book deal you have i did not go what if no <laughs> magic lawyers magic lawyers um i just realized we forgot to show the books oh, yeah. this is really oh, they're is, yeah. so beautiful they're just gorgeous so he has um got yeah, the, show us the first the one Zoom that first one in there stick that one. yeah because that's the one we haven't seen uh-huh uh -huh. there he is or just two conrad there yeah he's, um, conrad and, and this must be helena in that's the, helena in yeah that's helena. right and then i've actually just as, as of this morning seen a mock-up of the third book as well which um exciting 
the artist is called Martina Fachkova, and she um, actually, I think she won an award for the illustration of the second book. Um, yeah, just recently. stunning. It is really beautiful. It really is beautiful. So let's talk about the characters a little bit, and in the talking mm. about them, talk about the magic that they wield. So I, mm. I don't know if you would want to start with um, Helena's kind of telling the story in Tyranny yeah, of right. Faith, but Von Volt is certainly a major player. So you know, yeah, yeah. it's it's. The way, it, the way it's sort of von Volt is kind of the main character, but he's not the point of view character. Right. Excuse me. So he's sort of like um, Helena is his apprentice. So the story is starts with Helena. She's an old woman now. She's sort of in her seventies or eighties or whatever, and she's telling the story of her time with this storied justice. So, so Conrad von Volt he was the kind of the greatest justice of the age, um, and he got completely wrapped up in this sort of the empire sort of calamitous empire spanning events and at the time she was his apprentice and she had been in his employ for about two or three years and so she's looking back on that time and telling us it's a frame narrative um and so she's telling the story of von volt you know essentially so he's the main character but he's not telling his own story um so helena was sort of an orphan she was sort of plucked from obscurity from a place called moldau which is the capital of tolsberg um she tried to rob von Volt, and instead of like arresting and prosecuting her he essentially indentures her or he makes her an apprentice um he sort of sees the potential in her and that, and, and why that happens you know is a is something that, that is explored in book three um and so she becomes his apprentice she's sort of she's sort of street smart but interestingly so what i tried to do with the character of helena was you know if, if you have a difficult upbringing if you have um so she was a ward of the state she was orphaned by the wars that created the empire what was called the reich's creek um so her parents are both dead so she was a ward of the state and so she has this sort of street smart sort of whip smartness about her um but also because her upbringing was so troubled she's also very kind of um emotionally stunted so if you look at people who in the real world who have suffered you know, abusive up childhoods and abusive upbringings, um, what tends to happen is their emotional development sort of gets left in the kind of like teenage years. Mm -hmm. And so she's quite impulsive and mercurial. Uh, she's, sort of got, she's got a bit of a temper and she relies entirely on Von Volt for all of the stability in her life. So when Von Volt is in a bad mood, she's in a bad mood. And when Von Volt is unsure of something, which isn't very often, uh, you know, it, it, it affects her very profoundly. And so, you know, I tried to capture so this sort of dichotomy of someone who is both you know, intelligent and, and cunning and brave, but also um, someone who is very unsure of themselves. And also she's, you know, and essentially, I mean, she's, I think she's 20 or 21 in, in second book. So she's still a young woman mm -hmm. um, and, and unsure of her place in the world and whether she even wants to be an apprentice, uh, you know. And so she has this very complex relationship with Sir Conrad. And then Sir Conrad is this kind of extremely sure of himself you know never a man burdened by self-doubt um you know he has the law on his side he's an agent of the crown um he's he's got a brilliant mind um but he's also you know he's a slightly he's a compassionate man. he's a cold man um but he's a deep down he's a sort of ethical and compassionate man um and you know he's not going to you chop your head off of there's an, an alternative option for example mm -hmm. um and so and the story is essentially the the story is essentially the relationship of the two of them and how it evolves and they go from this sort of like master apprentice to and father daughter to more of a kind of a much more complex you know it's an, there's an unhealthy power dynamic between them and so right. i wanted to ex explore that as well right in, which in of course three. you know when um von volt then is attacked by a malady which is mm. you know somewhat magical in nature and begins to act in ways that you know um are not necessarily as upstanding as helena has come to expect um yes. that really throws her for a loop so absolutely i wanted to kind of um and, and the big question really with von volt is you know to, to what so helena has always sort of seen him as his paragon and in many ways he kind of comes across that way but then you know as time goes on the question really becomes has he always been right a, a paragon or am i really just is it the longer i spend with him the more i'm getting to know him and actually he's never been this person that i that i thought he was right. or is it circumstances are forcing him to become a, a, a badder person right. or is it some combination of, of the two um and so you know it's it's been a really sort of rich seam of of character interaction right. to kind of explore right. and and really explores you know the nature of power and mm. you know um 
what what happened Ab von volt has ultimate power really he has access to magic he has you know the backing of the emperor he can do whatever yeah. he wants so well, that's it and it's it is a question of um you know, to what extent can you sort of invest someone with the sort of absolute ultimate authority? Because it's and 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 the, where that kind of philosophical dilemma comes from is, you know, in my, in my practice as, as as a lawyer, a litigator specifically, and my experience in and around sort of criminal and civil courts, you a lot of the time a judge will have to, for example, f forget you know certain pieces of evidence so you know they'll know stuff but they aren't allowed to know it so mm -hmm. in this sort of strange contrivance that we have in in modern kind of advocacy adversarial legal systems where it's like someone might successfully get a piece of uh, an exhibit or a piece of evidence thrown out and so the judge is like well now i'm going to have to disregard this um and pretend that i've almost pretend that i've never seen it and so it's this strange kind of you, but you have seen it. So, right. you know. How do you actually pull that you out of your know. decision? Yeah, exactly. And, and it's just this idea of even if we train somebody to the nth degree, like, can we really kind of squash every last kind of prejudice and, and quirk out of their you know, decision making process? And so it's this idea, yeah, it's this idea of justice of ultimate power and they have the magic to kind of enforce that power. But you know, to what extent is that a, a particularly effective law keeping model? Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, which is all very interesting and and leads us back kind of to the card that we drew. So, um, <laughs> mwah, 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 mwah. so this um, is a was he a sort of shaman of some kind? Is he? Well, you know, do you want to know what you're the you're the what what is this? This is number two. It's usually the you'd be a high priestess normally. Yeah. So what is the that high priestess? Normally? The high priestess would be the keeper of like faith and um kind of an authority on faith but also okay. you know kind of the the government the governing of the faith so where you've got you know other characters in, in the cards that may be more of the spiritual ones this is this is the from on high kind of delivering right. this is how we do things this is the, there's a level of compassion there but there's also a level of this is how we do it you know the, this is the structure of the faith okay that, you know and in, so, in this particular deck we have the spin of according to my handy dandy little very battered guide yes book. please find the book because <laughs> like, and it's it's interesting that the interpretations of the different things that we, that we little, see yeah. with each deck there's a different interpretation different. so the high priestess i know and this one is that a one keeper of mysteries Books and knowledge point to the doors of mystery. To experience magic, you must cross the threshold and give yourself over to mystery. So I'm thinking uh, about this book and I'm like, right. whoa, how much that's can we talk about that without giving it away? Right. Because it's like absolutely. It's, oh, it's, that's, a, it's that's a great a one. one. I, I think, you know, in, in this in this world, you know, as I said, it was the, there is magic. It's kind of like the, the, there's more, much, there's much more magic in book two than there is in book one. Book one is essentially a murder mystery. The little bit of magic and there's a necromancy scene which is sort of quite haunting and what i wanted to do with so it's essentially it's death magic so in this world um all magic derives from the afterlife the afterlife is a is a real place um it's a kind of it's a it's a different plane of existence different dimension and um when mortals die in the world of the empire of the wolf their soul or their spiritual essence or whatever you want to call it travels to this other place um and this the other place is a kind of a world of almost almost different countries you know there's there are there's the what they call the adaxime which is the purgatorial plane so you the, or the plane of burden so you sort of land in this sort of it's a kind of like a marsh and you sort of land there and then your soul can go into different different places and there's there's a hell you know there's the halls of hell and there's some a place called the broken path which is a, a place that leads to the, the halls of hell this massive pathway huge kind of stone structure sort of kilometers you know wide and long which is a, which was the, the site of a battle you know in this sort of in the religious canon so but all worlds um all magic derives from this plane and it kind of leaked into the world what they call the magical what they in the story refer to as the cataclysm so centuries mm. before magic entered the world and, it, and what it did was it kind of it was it was like fugitive it kind of it took it bound humans and creatures together so you have like that's where the wolf men come from on the southern plains and there are mermen in the book as well although not in this trilogy but they're referred to and they tap into the, the magics of the afterlife. And so 
when I was, you know, coming up with the magic, I was thinking, what would an what would an investigator want? They would want, like, you know, the ability to talk to the dead, for example, or they would want the ability to sort of compel a person to tell them the truth, you know, extract a confession from someone. And all the justices have different powers depending on their kind of their aptitudes. And the magic that's in, that exists in the world, because it's so dangerous and and it's very very dangerous, um, because you know. Little, you know, beasties and, and demons and things kind of kind of make mischief. They can hijack the. Pro so if you create a link to a dead person, and this happens in the first book, you know they 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 travel to the afterlife to question someone who has died. Um, the parasitic kind of demonic entities leap onto that, they latch onto that connection, and they can mm. you know they can possess people and, and stuff. So it's, it's a very it's a very frightening, haunting process, and that's why they didn't really like to do it that much. But it's so. In, in, an, in an investigative sense, it's so probative because you can be like, who murdered you? And they'll be like, it was that guy over there. So, you know, <laughs> if you can get it to work, if you can get it to work, it's perfect. But of course, you often, but the, run, the risk you run is that something eldritch should you know, some malady happens with, you know, with the arcane. And so they keep it all under lock and key. In and books. Only the in, in code literally in books. That's exactly which... right. Which was really interesting to me about this mm. card because yeah, exactly. some of the codexes have gone missing and fallen into hands who should not have them. And so, you know, that's part of the, right. the book journey is how do we get them back? Exactly so, that. Yeah, so yeah. The, so I, I like the idea of having these sort of books un, under lock and key that, yeah. and only a certain class of people can right. read and use them. Mm. Right. Now, the challenge that we would set possibly for Von Volt, and you've already kind of talked about that. So supposing that, you know, we did want to know something um, mm -hmm. that maybe um, we can't figure out in the here and now, um, what what would he maybe do in order to be able to get some information? Does, you know. He'd have to get to the library. <laughs> well, we'd be so beyond the library. I'm thinking about. Okay, the book's <laughs> not in the library. <laughs> to the library the book's not there he, he wants wi is down he wants, to, he wants to he wants to know what happened he's looking for you know some some way to get into the afterworld what's what's he going mm. to do to get there so he needs to um so there's, it's, a, it's a seance kind of process so he has to um yeah, there's a there's a book called the grimoire necromancia which is a kind of um essentially an instructions manual on how to perform all the invocations and incantations etc to kind of get there so he um he would have this he has a medallion as well the medallion is kind of like a it's kind of like a psychic beacon so um it, it, if he need, it's sort of like an emergency boy um so if he needs to kind of make a quick exit he can kind of activate this medallion and then he just gets you know sucked straight back out so the way that they do it is there's something called the descendant incantation the nizan Arnavi, which is an incantation that you and you need a dead body so you need someone who is dead you need to make physical contact with that body yeah. um and they are like basically like an anchor dropped into the sea and the sea is the afterlife and you sort of hold on to them as you and you get pulled down with them um and you have to kind of ward yourself so that you don't get eaten or killed or whatever by all of the demons and horrible things in the afterlife and then you have a limited amount of time there. And what I wanted to do as well to make the process kind of um, a very high barrier to entry. So it's not you, it's not just so easy. You could be like, you know, who murdered you? You can't just do that. Um, I wanted to make it so that you can uh, well, you can lose you can lose your mind quite you know quite easily. But the body itself has to be like a fresh corpse. So you could go to like a morgue and have a month old skeleton, you know, whatever, and be like, you know who killed you it has to be if the body is is if they hate you as well so like if the if you killed the person and then you tried to use their body as an anchor that hate and fear and terror that they kind of take with them as they die it's like chum in the water for sort of demons so Ooh. you know so if they hate you or they're or, or if they're insane as well these kind of these send out these kind of psychic beacons and it, it just attracts things so you know, you, you, the conditions have to be just just right, really. Otherwise, it's extremely dangerous. Um, in fact, I wrote a short story uh, for Grimdark magazine about um, a seance that goes badly wrong, um, set for about 10 years before the events of the first book. And, uh, and a sort of greater demon kind of interrupts and it's it's very very messy um and so yeah and so then you, you ask your questions you've got about five minutes and then you've got to get the hell out of there <laughs> so then they kind of 
re-encant and they sort of return back to the surface, hopefully with the information that they need, but more often than not. And they no the attached demons and, in the and hopefully no, but of course, exactly. in, in these worlds, of course, things go wrong because that's what we're doing. So the book that's that it. we're talking about today, everybody, again, is The Tyranny of Faith by Richard Swan, and it is part of, tell me the name of the trilogy again, The Wolf Something, I don't know why. I the Empire remember. of the Wolf. The Empire okay. of the Wolf, there you go, and there are wolf men. And when is book three going to be out in the world, do we know? It's a it's it's next February, so they released them a year apart. Um, uh -huh. So the first one came out, I think, you know, February twenty twenty two. Um, okay. And this turn your face just I, came out a few months ago. I tend to hang on to the wrong things. This happens consistently with me. You mentioned merman, <laughs> and I know they're not yes. in the series. I'm going, <laughs> Will there be a merman book? Like, can we explore uh, that world now? Because I to want to write, know about um, them. <laughs> yeah, I'm desperate to write a merman book, and I um, pitched. I think because I had I came up with a great kind of merman world with a really cool hierarchy and um i pitched it to, to orbit for my next trilogy and they were like this is this is too this is too much merman like <laughs> <laughs> there's not too much merman there's no such no thing I'm in sorry, my mind i disagree <laughs> i also disagree but we'll read it i want to know about the merman <laughs> well i so hopefully uh, my next trilogy which i'm writing and uh, a conversation is going to happen in the next month or two with orbit about you know if they buy that um that does have Mermen in it, just not oh, in a excellent. huge. They, they so it would be essentially like a. It's set same same empire, but two hundred years later. So it was all uh... flintlocks, a colonial era kind of flintlocks, and um, it's a kind of a diplomatic mission to the to the mermen because they they magical practitioners. So what? I think it's well, really as really long cool. as they show up somehow because no, <laughs> oh, they I do. No, oh, they're in there. I need, oh, I don't need worry. The mermen. We're, we're good with that. <laughs> they're in there. <laughs> so Richard, where can people find you online? Best place to find me is, is Twitter. Um, my handle is uh, Richard underscore S underscore Swan. Um, but I'm also on Instagram as a Richard Swan author. Um, I think that's probably the best place. And I have a, I have a website. Okay. Uh, it's called StoneTempleLibrary.com. StoneTempleLibrary.com. Yeah. It's, it, 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 I think it's in both of those profiles. My Twitter and Instagram has it somewhere listed. So. And that has things like updates and... I have a little shop that I sell, you know, trinkets, book plates, and stuff on there. So um, that's the best place to find me. There it is. That's okay. clever. Hey. And if they go yeah. there, they can probably um, find your uh, other handles as well. So exactly that. Um, yep. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today. It was a great thank exploring you. the world with you. And um, maybe we will try and get you back when you have the third book out in the world for us. I'd love to. Absolutely. Well, at least when Thanks the moment come back. <laughs> <laughs> I was just you keep ta tantalizing you, tantalizing mm -hmm. you with hints of them and then never yep. write anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> No, I want the Merman book. <laughs> the Merman book for I, sure. I want it. I want the Merman book. We're going to team up I'm, on I'm Orbit. Trying. And we're going to be like, we're going to start a guerrilla marketing campaign. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take That's it. Right. <laughs> Make <sign>. right. <laughs> <laughs> This has been The Other Worlds with our guest Richard Swan. And the book we've been talking about is The Tyranny of Faith. Please join us again next time where we explore another world. We will see you again later. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.